Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome to our virtual event. My name is Maddie Gobo. I am the events manager here at Skylight Books. We're going to play a little song from Kim Gordon to start us off today. And then we're going to have an introduction from Daniel Chaffee at the Gota Institute. And then Kim and Isabel are going to be in conversation. Thank you all so much for being here today for this conversation with Isabel Graw and Kim Gordon. We are just thrilled and delighted to have them. Um, this is going to be a fantastic meeting of the minds. Um, so I hope you all are ready for a big delicious treat. Um, they're going to be discussing their new books, No Icon and In Another World, Notes 2014 to 2017. This event is co-presented by the Goethe Institute, uh, Los Angeles and Sternberg Press. Thank you both to our co-presenters. We're so happy to be partnering with you. Um, I do just wanna say a few words about Skylight Books. Skylight Books is an independent bookstore located in the Los Feliz neighborhood of Los Angeles, California. We are a very beautiful store. We have actual skylights. We've got a, a tree inside the store and we have a bookstore cat. It's a beautiful place to visit. Um, we hope you come by and see us. We're open right now on weekdays 11 to seven and weekends 10 to eight, um, if you wear a mask, socially distance, sanitize your hands, that sort of thing. But we've got lots and lots of books in there uh, and they've been missing you and they wanna see you and they wanna come home with you. So please come and stop by. Um, if you're not in Los Angeles, you can shop online on our website at skylightbooks.com. We're happy to ship books anywhere in the country. We're happy to ship copies of Isabel and Kim's books to you anywhere in the country. I'll be dropping a link to order their books in the chat in just a few minutes. Um, all right, so without further ado, I'm going to bring up my co-presenter, Daniel Chaffee. He is here from the Gota Institute, and he will give an introduction. Thank you, Maddie. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Daniel Chaffee, and I'm the program coordinator at the Goethe Institute Los Angeles. The Goethe Institute is, the, is Germany's cultural institute. Um, as we're hosting today's event in Los Angeles, I wanted to acknowledge our presence on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Tongva and Tatavian peoples. Uh, on behalf of our guests today, as well as our partners at Skylight Books and Sternberg Press, I'd like to ever welcome everyone to No Icon in Another World, a conversation between Isabel Graw and Kim Gordon. Based in Los Angeles, Kim Gordon is an artist, musician, and co-founder of the band Sonic Youth and author of the book, Kim Gordon, No Icon. Based in Berlin, Isabel Graw is an art historian, co-founder and publisher of the journal Text at Kunst, and the author of In Another World, Notes 2014 to 2017. Today, these longtime friends will share and discuss how their new books each relate to their current interests and past projects. While taking different approaches to the form of the memoir, both books touch on similar themes, especially the role of art in processing loss and abrupt change. Please join me in welcoming Isabel Graw and Kim Gordon. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel from Goethe Institute. Thank you, Maddie from Skylight Books. Thank you, Tatiana from Sternberg Press. And thank you, Kim, for doing this uh, with me. And uh, I'm, I'm so happy that we have a chance to speak about our respective books in this, uh, in this digital format. Um, so I was thinking, you know, how we could maybe structure this event. We could um, talk about a couple of topics and then in between, if it feels right, I could insert a reading of one or two of my miniatures, you know, if it's thematically making sense. Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's a really good idea. <laughs> so I was thinking, you know, you asked me to start. So I'm going to do that. I thought that maybe we could first think about the format of our books. They are rather different. Your book is a pictured diary, maybe, um, and it's called No Icon. Icon. It actually does contain some texts, quotes from you, manuscripts, proposals for a story, but it's mainly a picture book. Um, my book, In Another World, I would say oscillates between memoir and social critique and kind of tries to demonstrate 
how the universal flashes through the personal and how the personal also filters the universal. So I was asking myself and I would like to ask you and maybe we can talk about this. Why did we opt for these formats? What did we want to achieve with them? Um, well, first, let me say I really um, enjoyed the format you chose of fragments. Um, <clears throat> And uh, it actually inspired me to go back and <laughs> rework some, <laughs> some things I'd been working on um, in terms of writing. But, um, you know, for me, my book, I guess I kind of see it as a tour in a way through my life. Um, and it wasn't really my idea to do this book. I was approached. Um, and the thing is about photographs is of, if you're a performer or somebody in the public, you don't really have control over them. I mean, some, I suppose, like high up celebrities try to control and have that power to do that, but you still can't. And in a way it was sort of a way of reclaiming photos and, when it was first um, proposed to me by Rizzoli, uh, the editor Rizzoli, you know, they wanted, they presented something that had like a sample with pictures of my art as well. And at first I was kind of opposed to that because <laughs> the art, you know, didn't have any context except for me. Um, and it was just, I figured, oh, it's just gonna look, it's going to be used as design basically um but then i you know i kind of realized that um this is a very long-winded answer <laughs> but i'm never going to have a conventional art career because i'm never going to be separated from the performative part of my life is such a big part of who i am and even in my art and when i see everything together in the book there is this constant feeling of motion and performance in it. And so in a way I'm kind of some, uh, I'm always gonna be my own thing in a way outside of the music world and the art world <laughs> in a way. Um, but, I, so, but I also didn't want it to be one of these conventional sort of just branding books. So I liked choosing photographs that were rough you know, and kind of sweaty or, um, you know, if you have, I'm so used to, you know, I'm so used to seeing bad photos that I kind of wanted to curate <laughs> photos I liked, even if they weren't, even if they showed imperfections and, you know, everything. Um, it's kind of, if you have enough photos, it gives one an overall sense maybe of, who the person is, even if it's still a projection of image or whatever. Yeah, I think that's interesting because it's maybe something our books have in common that the borders, you know, between the private, our private and our public lives being fluid and all these activities kind of relating to one another, mm -hmm. it's a bit like a portrait of a multitasker in mm -hmm. both cases because, you know, you show images of you with your daughter in a concert, a fashion shoot, um, it's something that is more personal and something that is highly staged. And it's maybe, maybe similar in my book where I switch from observations in the gym to a gallery <laughs> dinner, to thinking about my own writing, to mourning the death of my parents. Mm. And in my case, it was different because I wasn't asked to make a book at all. It was more that uh, in 2013, when my father died, I felt a necessity for another format. Mm -hmm. And at first it was a rather private affair. And I was writing these, these miniatures every morning, you know, as a warm up, as I describe it in the foreword, but also in order to, to find a kind of a language where, you know, analysis and emotion are somewhat connected. And this is something, you know, 
a couple of writers are, are doing right now and have tried from from maybe from Saidi Hartmann to to Edouard Louis. There are many writers who try to to kind of uh, to have these two levels that are usually separated: the level of social analysis, sociological observation, and the level of more personal emotional narratives to have that kind of fused together. So I think that was one idea, but to be honest, I only realized after a while that this might be a book. At, mm -hmm. at first it was rather private, but then I thought there is some, something these fragments and to, to these kind of also collusions, you know, it's very, you know, like you jump from from a scene of mourning to a scene in the, you know, in, in, in the, the manicure, pedicure session. So there are all these, these jumps that, that can seem a bit abrupt. Uh, and I thought, but that's exactly how life is in this neoliberal economy where we are constantly having to adapt to shocks and new situations and where we can't opt for continuity there is right no such a thing yeah it becomes exhausting trying to keep everything <laughs> apart from each other <laughs> <laughs> um and in a way maybe that's kind of a construct that comes out of um years of uh patriarchal thinking i don't know <laughs> who knows um but no i found it very generous um your book that you you know, you were fairly fearless about, um, you know, whether talking about your your parents and your grief, um, but also just kind of, I mean, I know you, so I know that you're into fashion. So I, I thought that was also fun reading your observations and I kind of wanted to immediately have a conversation with you about that. <laughs> um, but, but also like, you know, to, um, talk about your maybe more bourgeois upbringing and how you, um, you know, you wanted to escape that. And in a way I kind of identified with that coming from, a, you know, not as more of a middle-class background, but very kind of bore, boring, you know, um, I mean, my parents weren't conventional, but, and going to New York and just feeling like, God, I'm just always going to be middle class, you know. And how can I play music, or how can I um, be, you know, sort of edgy and in my music, or because I, I remember, um, yeah, Reese Chatham saying to me, "You're always going to be middle class." <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I just thought that was um, that you were fearless in talking about. You know, and kind of like as somebody who's, you know, is a critical thinker and on, on the left, that you could admit to all of that and, and having, um, um, you know, I thought that was, that was um, interesting. I think that was really important to me to, to kind of allow for contradictions and mm -hmm. to also insist on contradictions being possible like it's possible mm -hmm. to be on the left and to be someone who's interested in marxist value theory and to be really interested in fashion and luxury at the same time um so you know i i thought that that's important to to point to also the the tensions that can result from that and also what you said about, you know, being forever middle class or being forever bourgeois. Um, I think one of the motives in the book also, um, also kind of deals with, you know, my former desire to be a Simone de Beauvoir type bohemian intellectual. Mm. And then the acknowledgement in Trump times because you know, between 2014 and 17, when I wrote the book, a lot of political shifts happened. You know, uh, Brexit happened, Trump got elected, um, Me Too happened. So to realize in, in, in this changed political climate that the 
rule-breaking libertarian bohemian mm -hmm. that I always had kind of been interested in, that this whole figure also of the artist mm -hmm. all of a sudden has different connotations because someone like, Tr like Trump is exactly like this, this rule-breaking, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so of course, then you can say, what kind of rules are we talking about? And maybe they are aesthetic rules and to break them is still interesting. And I would agree with that. But nevertheless, there, there have been all these shifts which made me look at my own milieu and my own kind of attachments mm -hmm. uh, slightly differently. And I had to renegotiate all of that in a, very, in, in a landscape that was constantly changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, you know, I live in Los Angeles now, and during the whole um, campaign, um, you know, when Bernie was, I obviously am a big Bernie supporter. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the kind of um, liberal mainstream media was so anti Bernie. And then I realized actually artists in New York who are supposedly like politically oriented um, or in LA too, but I, I've somehow associated it with New York. I suddenly saw New York as a much more elitist kind of situation. And they were, you know, they were anti-Bernie. You know, they were just afraid that he was gonna get nominated and lose. And, and so I saw these, kind of the, our world establishment is very much like the liberal media, you know, like CNN or MSNBC, like no one wants to give up their power, mm -hmm. you know, and the democratic establishment doesn't want to give up their power. And anyway, so that was kind of interesting, just even though LA is quite the city of <laughs> elitism too, um, you know, I, it was just seeing New York in a different way. and reading the New York Times in a different way. Mm -hmm. and that, was, that was interesting. Yeah, and I was also thinking, you know, about the titles of our books, because, mm -hmm. you know, you called your book No Icon, mm -hmm. which of course is a performative contradiction because of course you are an icon, I would say. And I called my book In Another World, which I figured you know, has for me like three meanings. On the one hand, it's about the other world where you find yourself literally in once your parents have died. Mm -hmm. Then it's also about the other world that kind of slowly emerged between 2014 and 2017. I already mentioned that because of all these political and social shifts, Trump, Brexit, Me Too, the politicization of the art world. And finally, the other of literature Mm -hmm. I might have tried to enter with this book. It's maybe a, f a flight from one world mm -hmm. where, I, of course, I still belong because I'm, and there are many texts on art and exhibitions in this book as well. But it's an attempt to, to add another world, the world of literature. Yeah. So, but why did you opt for No Icon? Um, well, I think it was in one, I didn't, <laughs> When they came to me, um, the editors said, um, we were looking, you know, they've done um, this book on Chloe Savigny and which is a great book. And I had written an intro for it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they said, we were trying to think of who could be a feminist icon we wanted to do a book on. And I, I was against that idea because just the way that feminism has become a brand and, and um, it kind of undermines um, really having to deal with um, more subtle and gray area issues. Um, anyway, so I, and also my record was no home record. <laughs> um, you know, you're not supposed to use no in a title. <laughs> so, but I was like, why not? You know, and, and um, that record had been influenced by things that were really important to me when I first moved to New York, like No Wave Music. Um, 
and also, and then I was just thinking about the idea of displacement. Like I moved back to LA, but it's a different place, you know, than growing up here. I live in a different part of the city. My parents are long deceased. Um, and kind of having gone through, um, you know, like a heavy divorce, you know, after living with somebody and sort of like kind of what is my identity now and where is my sense of home? And I guess I kind of feel like um, it's kind of where I'm most centered or interested in as well as where my daughter is. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, I feel really at ease and comforted when she's with me. Mm -hmm. Same yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, so, you know, home is, and you know, there's so much, un, so many unhoused people in LA, you know, it just became, there were many kind of reasons why that worked for me, that title. So, but no icon, um, obviously you can't make a book of pictures of yourself <laughs> and, you know, you can't get out of being an, an icon if that's what you're doing. And, but I, I, um, I just didn't want it to be a conventional book like that, I guess. Yeah, and it's not. And also I think this no, the strong negation in a Freudian sense is always an affirmation. So, you know, there's this, 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 double, this double play. But, you know, when looking through your book and also when thinking about mine, I was asking myself, like, to what degree do we expose ourselves in these books and to what degree do we hide in them? And what kind of strategies do we use in order not to fully give ourselves away, this might be even more relevant for your former book, Girl in a Band, <laughs> evidently. But, you know, I, I'm always thinking about this question, you know, how to protect, um, especially one's private life or what has been left of it at a time where, you know, we live at a time where, where the digital economy, social media, for instance, targets our private life and markets it and where it becomes harder and harder to defend something that that we do not show and that is not marketed. So considering that you have a lot of books also of your, you know, personal life in uh, of your daughter, for instance, and one picture of Thurston <laughs> In, um, in in the book, I was I was wondering how how you negotiated this this balance between exposure and withdrawal. Um, yeah, I mean it was yeah. Or when I was writing uh, my memoir, it was um, you know even if you write a what you think is a flattering description of somebody, they can still hate it <laughs> because nobody I think really wants to be defined and, or they may not just see themselves in a certain way. So I really tried to avoid um, writing about the band actually as much as I could. That's why when I wrote about Sonic Youth, I mostly picked songs that I sang and talked about them. And it was at that point that I felt like I wanted to make little essays about these songs and I kind of felt like oh the whole book should have been essays shit <laughs> um but I don't know I just kind of even as a memoir you're telling a story so um you know I just wanted it to have the right tone I I um I didn't want it to be a book about sonic youth because someone will eventually write finally a good book about sonic youth um, you know, and I didn't want it to be solely about the breakup of my marriage and the band, but it was a part of the story. So I basically just, and I didn't want to expose my daughter too much to, you know, it, it was very, yeah, this filtered. And also I, I realized that 
it's kind of a contradiction, but maybe the interest in me is that I've been told I am kind of mysterious in a certain way. <laughs> so it's like, you don't want to give too much information away. I don't know. <laughs> but I, don't, I also didn't want it to just be something that upped my brand. You know, I, I wanted to, I really used it as a way to think about my life as I'm sure you did. And, um, but you know, I did, it was, it's very difficult because now I could, I feel like I could write some great things, but they involve other people. And if I was really a writer, I would do that. Like if I was like a, you know, let's say I wrote a book, auto fiction or something. Um, you know, there's some great conversations or dialogue that I could use or, you know, and even if it's supposedly fictionalized, it's kind of, well, that person will know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And it is um, definitely a restrictive way of thinking if you care too much about what other people think, or maybe they could even sue you. Yeah, so um, I, I don't know how other writers deal with it, you know, that who um, don't, who just go full, you know, I, I can't think of an example right now, but there are well, many. It's funny, it's funny that you say this because I'm, I'm currently writing a book, a novel on friendship. Oh. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I think about what I call instrumental friendships, which are friendships where one uses one another, which are basically all of the friendships we have a little bit to a certain degree in the art world at least. And then of course, I also use these friendships and the experience of my own friend friendships. So there is this kind of instrumental nature mm -hmm. to using other people for your books. And, and in another world, I also was kind of worried about that. And I tried to, you know, I, I avoided the names uh, I fictionalized parts. Mm -hmm. I also, you know, try to make it clear that it's often not the truth of my life, but mm -hmm. a kind of retroactive, how can I say, idealization. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, and if it's the truth, it's my truth. Like my siblings, for instance, would tell the story of my childhood very differently. So there are these, these kind of strategies, but the problem of course remains that, that there is this using other people kind of dimension to it. And I agree with you, one shouldn't always worry about what will they say. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, one also has kind of responsibility uh, toward other people and a kind of ethic, you know, obligation yeah. to, uh, to also, you know, uh, feel not completely guilty about what one does so yeah it's yeah. a fine line to walk yeah um i don't know yeah it is it's kind of like you don't want to uh, let the person um oh shit <laughs> somebody's here <laughs> 86 year old contractor i'm sorry you have to open the door <laughs> i don't know why it's here <laughs> I forgot this in the mailbox. Huh? I'm in the mailbox. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay, thanks. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, I forget what I was saying. Oh, you know, it's not like you can get their approval. You know, like you don't want. I know you just, I guess, have to be thick skinned about it if, you know, and, or discuss it with them, you know, but. Uh, and, and also use these fictionalizing strategies because, you know, it's not necessarily also in another world is not so much about my life, but mm -hmm. it's more about the meeting point between, you know, personal observations and mm -hmm. social, power structures uh, mm -hmm. that that kind of impact on my life and I try to kind of grasp that I don't want to just talk about 
myself, but I want to talk about something that is much more general than that. Sure. And it's like social structures I'm interested in, but you can't capture them without mm -hmm. looking at the particular. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, like I, I, um, I kind of realized, um, how do I write a, I don't know, how do I write a memoir and not talk about myself? Because <laughs> um, I realized I don't really, I'm not really comfortable with this, but I, I did, um, you know, so I tried to make um, like growing up kind of a portrait of LA in the 70s and then New York in the 80s and 90s and kind of do it that way to make, sort of a geographical context. And, um, but it is true, like you don't always get it, any truth anyway by telling the truth or, you know, or saying what you think is the truth. Or um, I tend to approach things more sideways and that's why I write my lyrics too. It's, you know, they're kind of fragmented or um, and, um, but it was interesting actually listening to that song, Earthquake, because I hadn't heard it in a long time. And it's really a song about, um, you know, the you is a person, but it's also the audience, you know, and kind of and confessional to the audience about um, this kind of relationship. Like having a relationship. Yes, and the I is related to the you. Yeah. The I only exists because it, there is a you. There is, it's constituted by the you, so to speak. And I was also thinking when you talked about memoirs um, and this necessity to say I in a memoir, mm -hmm. of course, the question is then who is speaking? And mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, it is, of course, me, like in another world, it's me, but it's also not me because uh, the author Marie-Louise Kaschnitz, a German author I like a lot, she said this quite nicely. She says, no I only contains oneself. Every I consists of several eyes. Mm -hmm. And so I think in a way this could be said to be demonstrated in both our books that that one's individuality is linked to others. Sure. Yeah, that is universal. Yeah, I, I was, um, but yeah, I mean, even like when I was reading many of, of your fragments, like I related to your observations about branding and things that I think, you know, I think about all the time and um, kind of a sociological thought processes. Um, I don't know, like I, yeah, I love Joan Didion's writing and the way her eye is, and I can't actually <laughs> explain it, what it is, but it's it's also kind of, um, it's like a very, you get a, a sense almost opposite of like this kind of existential aloneness um, from her point of view. But yeah, it's also like so um, uh, kind of, it's like, it always feels gender neutral. Um, and that it's the only thing that exists. I don't know. Yeah, the year of magical thinking was of course one of my inspirations. Oh, uh, I, didn't read, I, didn't, I was afraid to read that book. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's I, really, I really like her essays I, um, more than her fiction, but um, I, I should read it, but I just thought it was, would be too devastatingly sad. <laughs> well, it is, but it's also very good and a very interesting writing yeah. experiment. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, I've read basically all the morning literature that exists. Yeah. Roland Barthes, uh, to mm -hmm. Simone de Beauvoir, to, you know, um, uh, now Marie-Louise Kaschnitz, many, many authors, uh, Handke. But I thought maybe this is a good moment for one reading. 
What oh, do yeah. you think? Sure, definitely. But I thought maybe um, maybe I, I will I will read something. It's called uh, Leftist Man. Okay. It's short. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Okay. My friend Jay is right. Often men who think of themselves as on the left are a bigger problem for us than blatant misogynists. It's usually harder to deal with them than with the men who at least openly display their sexism. The methods that many left-wing supposedly feminist men use to, to dismiss the work of their women colleagues are also much subtler and harder to grasp in comparison. Often, instead of openly debasing women's work, they just ignore it and don't speak about it. They'll avoid asking women colleagues how their work is going, as if it didn't exist. Alongside these techniques for making their contributions disappear, a lot of leftist men also have a variety of methods for putting one down, which often arrive disguised as praise. An example, yesterday of all days, my birthday, I happened to receive an email from a colleague that was meant to be nice, but which nonetheless displayed a subtle form of discrimination. He tells me of another male friend and colleague who was full of praise for one of my lectures. This lecture showed that I'd done a lot of research, that I am a proper Marxist now. The paternalism bestowed on my work in this ambiguous praise is quite astonishing. These men present me with a report card, saying in a roundabout way that they can finally take my work seriously now that I've been such a good student. I'm granted membership to the club, but under the conditions that they have set. From this point of view, I'm still the docile student whom they need to set on the right path with their encouraging words. And this is happening to me when I'm 55. That seems like they're threatened by you. <laughs> <laughs> Fear of frustration. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if um, it's, I somehow have the feeling that that sort of sexism is more prevalent in Europe or Germany. I don't know. But yes. I mean, sexism in America seems more uh, basic. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's, yeah. the subtle kind of version is more widespread here, this kind of uh, putting you down by praising you. Right. Yeah, sort of, yeah, controlling, defining the situation, always. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I, if, if this kind of exaggerated also, you know, it can also come as, as a kind of seeming glorification that actually is a way of, you know, constructing you as other uh, and not allowing you a kind of equal position, but um, I I must say that uh, I always thought that you know uh, Germany, especially in the cultural sphere, um, uh, was much tougher sexism-wise than mm. I mean, say a city like New York, uh, mm. where I always uh, felt I could breathe more. But maybe it's imaginary. Maybe it's a projection. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. But I think just New York always gives the impression of freedom. And I think um, because people take what they want from the city. It's like nobody really, you can you know, lose yourself. And I think that's kind of free. Um, yeah. Why don't you read the Daft Punk uh, fragment? That's interesting. <laughs> I, I will have to look for it because I, oh, where is it, where is it? Um, because I was, I was actually preparing for, for something else. I was preparing for, for, about souvenir, for souvenir. But before, maybe we can just talk about one thing um, 
that relates to both our books and also to Girl in a Bad in a Band. <laughs> okay, in a band. Um, it's this question how how to capture something that is lost. Uh, you know, in my case, lost parents. Um, uh, in your case, a band like Sonic Hughes, which doesn't exist uh, anymore. How to, you know, use this work of mourning for your own, for, for one's own work. And how, how do losses structure our yeah. books? And I, I, and I think in my case, I, I try to deal with this losses by holding on to things, you know, like when I talk about um, the letters of my mother or when I talk about a message of her on the mailbox or when I talk about the gravestone where my father's name is put on, all these, these kind of uh, things, some of these things are like relics because my parents were in touch with them and others are kind of, you know, holding their memories. So I think all these things enter my book as a way to deal with loss. But I was wondering if you could talk about that as well, because I, I, I sensed something like that as well from your book. Well, also like, just to say that um, I feel like the way you, you talk about your parents and things like the gravestone and these different markers it's kind of interesting because it builds the picture of what a half life is or the concept of half life um you know you you pass away but you <laughs> you leave so much behind <laughs> you know and memories and um stuff stuff yeah yeah um and uh I don't know when I you know wrote Girl in a Band. It was definitely um, more of a. It was hard. You know, it was more grieving and kind of um, talking through things in my head. Um, this book, No Icon, is is more of a celebration in a way um, to go. You know, just looking at the pictures and like, oh, I did. I guess I did do a lot of things or. Mm -hmm. um and you know I and also when I wrote the memoir it was kind of well again it was not my idea <laughs> someone approached me um it was a way to just if I died the next day it would have some story mm -hmm. that I had and, um, and your version also your version of version of and I guess a, a bit the same with um with no icon um, in terms of how I, you know, I was, you know, the designer had a real input in what pictures were in and I provided materials and, but I, I kind of didn't want to get too involved with it because it, one could spend forever, you know, trying to decide and I, I was a little arm's length with some of it. And um, yeah, going pictures bring back so many memories, you know, and um, I was surprised that I actually didn't find it sad, really. Um, and in fact, you know, recently I had to look at a this is kind of long, but a video of us from the bridge benefit we did for Neil Young when we first, the first one we played, which was acoustic and we never played acoustically and we got on stage and we couldn't hear ourselves and we knew it might be a disaster. So I brought like a guitar to smash and which I did. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but it was actually the first, I was like, it was basically my nightmare gig. Um, not being able to get through a song or whatever, um, anxiety dream. And, but it's kind of the first thing I'd seen that actually made me miss playing with the band because we'd all experienced this bond of, we all went through it together. And, you know, uh, someone from management was like, well, 
why don't we just choose this song because <laughs> you guys got through it. And we were all like, oh no, let's show it warts and all. You know, it's a real moment <laughs> of history for the band. So, um, so that was kind of um, interesting. Or that just surprised me that I wasn't, uh, it wasn't as hard to watch. And the same thing going looking at pictures, like, oh, that outfit wasn't so bad. Or <laughs> I thought I had a horrible sense of style. And, you know, just, um, I didn't, yeah, it was, I, I, I didn't find, it was no, yeah, I really yeah. felt it was more of a celebration in a way. It was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I guess in another world, uh, is a book that is in a different stage you know it's yeah. it's a labor of mourning I think to yeah. a certain degree it also does celebrate certain aspects of life but it's also trying to capture these uh, how can I say um, epistemological changes that happened during these years not only in my life but also more generally and that may be prepared the ground for for where we are now but mm -hmm. maybe i should read um just one of the morning um uh, texts because i thought i mean the duff punk i also like but uh i i thought maybe the morning th theme is, is more important and time is kind of running so maybe i, I do that one and then then that's my reading for tonight <laughs> so the text i'm reading now is called souvenir yesterday morning something strange happened I woke up early, as always, plagued once again with agonizing thoughts about my mother's sudden death. It's especially cruel to me that I never receive any sign from her, and I began to fiercely complain about this in my mind to an imaginary counterpart. I couldn't accept a situation in which my urgent wish for contact isn't heard in which my mother remains inaccessible to me. I got more and more worked up and finally grabbed a book from my nightstand to calm down. It was The Story of My Life by Georges Sand, a book I recovered from my mother's belongings. I opened the book and out fell a postcard that I wrote to my mother from London in 1992. The postcard was of Fragonard's The Souvenir in the Wallace Collection, a painting depicting a woman in a lustrous robe as she carves a letter, probably the first letter of her sweetheart's name, into the bark of a tree. The only witness to this scene is a dog, which must have been the impetus for the feminist interpretation of the scene I wrote on the back of the postcard. In the short text, I express my hope that my mother will like the picture and interpret it as an allegory of a situation in which female writers couldn't expect to reach a public. Her efforts to immortalize herself would have attracted little notice in the 18th century, which is why in the painting it's only a dog that plays the role of the public for a female producer. That this card, a communication with my mother, fell into my hands at precisely the moment I desperately wanted a sign from her makes me believe in higher powers. Some entity wanted to comfort me with this postcard. My mother stuck it in this particular book by Georges Sand, which she was probably reading at the time it arrived. Now I'm wondering whether I can hope for a similar sign from my dead father. That's great. Yeah, it's touching. <laughs> Right. souvenir but it's uh i mean on the one hand it kind of points to something that runs through in another world as a light motif which is my catholic upbringing and and the kind of interest in in a kind of transcendental dimension mm -hmm. higher powers um you know that's i think one theme and on the other hand it's again an attempt to to kind of get in contact with the, the deceased, the one you love, but who's not there via, you know, objects this person was in touch with, these kind of relics, like the postcard that fell out of the book that she had been reading as well. So I think that, you know, 
while during my parents' lifetime, I was rather neglectful about all these things, you know, if my mother would write me a letter, I would kind of, of course, not always keep it. But mm -hmm. once she died and once my father died, I was like very, very keen on, on all these objects, you know, I, I needed them around me because they were the last possibility to kind of be in touch. Mm -hmm. So that's also kind of religious. It's like, you know, this, this relic dimension that enters your life. And, uh, and I realized how, you know, of course I hate the Catholic church, but this, the, the fact that I was brought up in this kind of, you know, by nuns basically in the Catholic schools that did mark my sensibility, you know, maybe also my, my interest in pictures, mm. painting, all of that, I think has this kind of background. And I only realized all of that when my parents were not there anymore. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I was not brought up religiously at all. I, um, when I was a teenager, I read Alan Watts and <laughs> sort of, uh, Zen, about Zen Buddhism and that makes more sense to me. Um, but, you know, I, I think about my parents both pretty much every day. And um, I, I do too. You know, it's, um, yeah, and I have some guilt about, you know, not being, when my father died, I was, in, I was on the East Coast and he was in hospice, you know. And same with when my mother died, I was on the East Coast as well. And, um, but because my father died in a hospital, it was hard, you know, it's sadder. So, you know, as you talked, I mean, both of your parents' deaths seem sad. <laughs> you know, your mother suddenly died, you know, but, um, I, you know, so I, this feeling of, that you talk about though, of um, your safety net being gone. You know, I remember when my father died first, your sense of mortality starts rearing its head. Like, you know, I'm, ne I'm not, I'm an, oh God, I'm an adult, <laughs> you know, and I don't have any parents and I don't really have any family except my daughter and my brother who's schizophrenic. Um, and so it kind of makes you feel, um, you know, like an orphan in a certain way, but it, that's so un unrealistic because life, yeah. life goes, that's the life cycle. And, um, um, but it definitely gives one a sense of one's immortality. In your yes, on, on, I totally agree with you. On the one hand, it's like waking up with full responsibility for one life, even for one's life, even, even though one was always responsible for it, mm -hmm. The existence of the parents kind right. of constituted a different horizon. Once they are gone, the horizon that you took for granted is gone. But on the other hand, I, mu I must say that apart from the loss and the mourning and the sadness, there is also something liberating mm -hmm. about not being defined by mm -hmm. one's parents anymore. Parents have a tendency to kind of you know, ascribe certain characteristics onto you or kind of put you or identify you with a certain place. And I also realized that, you know, once my parents were dead, I could reconsider whether this place I supposedly occupy and this identity I kind of, you know, am identified with, whether this is actually what I want and sure, whether- yeah maybe there is someone else uh, uh, kind of waiting to be awoken um, uh, that wasn't allowed to show up because I was ascribed to this Isabel uh, right. by my parents for a long time. Yeah, and you, you realize, um, I guess that is part of growing up. <laughs> you, know, like the, you, you realize that your parents' values aren't necessarily your values or, but there is such a deep, ingrainment of and some of them are good you know um but I, I realized that I raising my daughter 
I felt um, a need to present this very more conventional structure as much as I could because for overcompensating for taking her on tour and exposing her to this kind of rock and roll lifestyle, but you know. Um, and I, I, I don't know, and then at some point I realized, why do I, <laughs> why do I see myself as middle class? Like, actually I'm really not such a conventional person, but I do, I did want to like, as if I wanted to give my daughter that choice of knowing what, you know, real structure was. Yeah, yeah by, you know, um, allowing her to go to the tennis club, organizing violin lessons, you know, mm -hmm. these kind of rituals uh, mm -hmm. that are identified with, uh, you know, conventional bourgeois upbringings are something that I want to be able to offer to my daughter as well. Um, of course, uh, the more of a teenager she becomes, she less, she, the less interested she is in these bourgeois rituals. <laughs> as she should. She shouldn't yeah. be interested in them. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. She's right to the she's absolutely right to reject them, but I have this this kind of impulse to to kind of offer her, you know, the, the tennis club option. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. Yeah, I didn't feel that. I just felt a need to expose her to different, you know, things, you know, art. And yeah. it was very hard, even as a child, she was <laughs> kind of um, she knew what she wanted and she, she didn't want that. <laughs> my daughter refuses to go to the museums or to accompany me to galleries. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's a good thing. You know, um, she, uh, she has to reject this at this point. Yeah. But I think that we are kind of, um, arriving at the end right now. It's, uh, nine o'clock in Germany. So I guess it's one o'clock in LA. Uh, yes. Maddie? Yes, hello. Finally came out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much. This has been fantastic. Would you guys like to take a couple of questions? We do have some here on the Q&A tab. Kim? Sure. A oh. couple. <laughs> like, let's say ten, 10 minutes. Is that okay? Perfect. <laughs> All right, so if you click that Q&A tab, you can see them right there. Um, I guess I can answer the first one. Uh, Lisa asks um, the way the pandemic changes an artist's role. I mean, for me, it, it, it's, you know, I mean, it's pretty individual. I think um, some of my friends are just kind of happy, actually, <laughs> being in their studio and not having to be so social or... Um, but I found, like I found it was weird just putting a book out into a void. And I think I did one, you know, like Zoom talk with it. I was happy not to have to actually do a lot of promotion or anything. Um, but I was also supposed to go on tour. So it kind of, as a performer and musician, it kind of, um, I have, I feel like I'm in living in this sort of suspended time where I have to remind myself um, what performance is and <laughs> kind of like that I might do it again soon, but I just need to be ready, but it's so abstract at this point. So it's kind of a, um, so I've been working in my studio doing painting and other things. But it's, it's just kind of um, feeling like you're really not getting feedback about anything that you put out. It's just going out there. Yeah, it's very lonely. It's, um, I mean, I, as, a, as a writer, on the one hand, I would say that I always kind of find myself in a qu quarantine type situation. Um, but of course, also I have been rather privileged because I, since I have a professorship, I didn't have to worry about money. And at first I enjoyed the fact that I had no social or professional obligations anymore, no talks to give, 
no meetings, no dinners, and that I could just do my writing. But then also it felt that I'm writing into this space free of resonance. Mm -hmm. And it also, you know, felt that I'm lacking impulses uh, because every meeting and dis me discussions with friends, it's, it's motivating and it gives you energy. And so I, I felt this lack of energy, especially in January and February, because Berlin is rather harsh then, I sat at my desk, like really needing, needing to kind of gather my strength and force myself to go on because it felt like, you know, so senseless in a way um, to, to, it's like, what for, who for, why? And, you know, and of course it's wonderful that we have these Zoom possibilities, but it's of course not the same thing as when we actually do share a space. The yeah. problem now is we don't share the same space. So it's, it's different, you know, but when we share a space, something totally unexpected, a third thing can happen. We can look into our eyes. And so yes, it's, uh, it's difficult, but I think it's of course easier for writers because books can still be read mm -hmm. and are not uh, necessarily depending on, on the performative so, so much. Yeah. Uh, what was, let me look at the questions again. Oh, now I don't see the questions anymore. Uh, did you look at your Q&A? Uh, oh, now I see it. How many time? Okay. You, you should talk about your favorite book. Oh, that's too, that's too hard. <laughs> okay, so sh so then I, I'm supposed to talk about where I am in the morning process. Yeah. Okay, where am I in the morning process? I think that it's, um, you know, my father died in 2013 and my mother died in 2015. So now we are in 2021. So, you know, the pain of having lost them is, of course, not so acute anymore. But mourning is a never ending process in my mind. You know, there are often people who ask you, hasn't it stopped now? Aren't you over this? Isn't it fine? And of course it isn't because you keep, you know, processing and you keep thinking about your parents. And as Kim said, you know, they are with you every day. In, in some way they appear in dreams, in daydreams, but also, you know, suddenly you think of, your mother, because a woman you meet in the pharmacy has the same shape of nails. Mm -hmm. That's an experience I write about in, mm -hmm. in another world. So I think it's, it's, it's not, it's not, it's, it will never end, but it's less acute and painful. It, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the phase where I'm really upset and want them back. I have accepted it. I'm, I feel much kinder toward the fact that they are deaf, I, I can, you know, it's, I'm, 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 I'm agreeing with it, but I do miss them and it's ongoing. So let's look at the chat. So there's someone who asked if there's a Dev David Hammond's flag behind you, Kim. Peggy Pierrot asked this. Many connections between your work and African American culture. Could you tell us a little about how African American has had an influence on your work? Well, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, actually, somebody gave me this flag, but I, um, it is, yeah, the African American, uh, United States of African America um, flag. And I don't know, I, I do, yeah, I did grow up listening to jazz and, Yes, I loved Ar Arnett Coleman. I used to listen to a lot of jazz when I was a teenager. Um, but I don't know, like his work um, is, I, I think, performative, a lot of it, um, and which I kind of relate to. And just that he 
seem like an outsider to the art world, even though he was strategic in a certain way. Um, but I, you know, I can't say that I'm in general influenced by African American art. Um, more and more seeing, you know, you're getting to know more, but um, I see him as just kind of uh, one of the most interesting. He's one of my favorite artists, basically. Same here. Yeah. I got the question about the relics, whether relics are religious or sentimental. Mm. And I think that my interest in relics has a very different trajectory it started with thinking about performance art and conceptual art mm -hmm. and realizing that so-called dematerialized practices are actually not dematerialized at all mm -hmm. because the artists often provide um, objects uh, that, that are kind of traces of the performance or the conceptual activity. And these objects are often relics. Um, think of Anne Imhoff's work to, to name a more recent example where, you know, where uh, the, 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 there are objects used in the performances that then uh, function as artworks that are charged with this performative authentic energy. Of course, Boyce, Josef is someone who also comes to mind if you think about this kind of relic dimension of of uh, uh, of performances so this is this was the original context uh, i i thought about when when thinking about relics and i think that we find a lot of kind of religious motives mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in in artistic production and as max weber has shown you know religious um elements are also uh, totally uh, existing in, in capitalism. So there's uh, in, in, in this secular world, the secular world is full of quasi religious um, rituals. So, um, you know, the belief in money, I mean, I, I don't, don't get me started, but uh, anyhow, so, so this, this is more my interest in, in relics. And I think that, um, um, of course, in the case of my parents, there, there is a admittedly a sentimental uh, dimension to them and a kind of uh, effective attachment. I'm, I'm interested, I think, in thinking about these relics in a way that allows for these emotions, but that also analyzes them as objects that are seemingly in touch with the one who owned them at first. Mm -hmm. and, and thus bring us in touch with this person as well. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I mean, with photographs, yeah, they're relics, but like, say for me, one thing about, like I have a photo, I think I put in the book, it's an Instagram picture of me that Richard Prince did, that he gave me a portrait. Yeah, it's, it's in the book. It was taken by a photographer for Paper Magazine, and then he sold it, I believe, to some other magazine. And then he sued Richard Prince <laughs> for using it. And so this is a question of ownership. And I do feel like there are photographers who are making money off of my image. And um, that's a different kind of, you know, the relics, I guess you could say the photos, but they, uh, they also have a, a use value. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, they depict you. So by publishing them under your name, I mean, of course you, you, you mentioned the photographers and they are famous ones, Richard Kern, Spike Jones, you know, uh, that are all mentioned, but you kind of take ownership of these uh, photographs and um, claim them mm -hmm. in a way it's like claiming your life. And maybe this is something we both do in our books in very different ways. Mm -hmm. It's making this claim yeah. to, you know, and also to do it with, with very different formal means that we consider um, necessary. In my case, it's the fragment 
uh, and uh, a certain type of quasi sociological but also autofictional writing mm -hmm. and in your case it's this collage these abrupt uh, transitions between mm -hmm. spheres that seem unconnected but are actually interconnected mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's a way of writing the narratives of our lives according to our own rules, but also showing that there are many external determinations that that we also have to deal with. Yeah, we you can't control, so you just... We are, not, we are not free, right? Far from it. Yeah. 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 Maybe that's, that's how we should end it. What do Sounds you think? Good. Sure. <laughs> what does everybody else think? Medi? Daniel? A beautiful answer to end on. All right. Thank you both so much. Um, this has been a treat. And uh, I think our audience has really enjoyed it both on Zoom and on Facebook Live. Kim and Isabel, thank you so much for making the time for this conversation today. Thank you for hosting it. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, and I want to say uh, one more thank you to the Goethe Institute and Daniel Chafee. Uh, thank you again for uh, helping promote this and putting this together. This has been a treat and hopefully we can have more conversations like these in person very yes. soon. Very soon. <laughs> All right, uh, Kim and Isabel, is there anything else you would like to say before we say our goodbyes? I just want to thank everybody and I want to say, Kim, I enjoyed this. It was great to see you. <laughs> it was wonderful seeing you all bait on a screen. And I hope that we can soon see each other in real life. Yeah, I hope and so. Continue this conversation. It was wonderful. Thank yeah. you all. All right. Cheers. Goodbye, everyone. Take care. Thank you for coming. <laughs>